Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. These are the stories that set your agenda. Israel launches a strike on Iran, according to US officials. But there are conflicting reports out of Iran about the extent of any damage. Iranian media report the country's nuclear facilities are safe. Stock slump as investors rush to haven assets on concerns of a widening Middle East conflict. Brent crude briefly spikes above $90 a barrel. Plus, voters in the world's largest democracy head to the polls. We will be live in India as the country's six-week-long election gets underway. Let's check in on these markets then. The fog of war is present for us as we try to get more details on these strikes again that we're hearing from U.S. officials, at least one strike, according to U.S. officials, from Israel to Iran. We are awaiting the details. Certainly the sense is that either the attacks were limited or that the Iranians are playing this down or that both of things are true. But again, we continue to wait for more reporting to get clarity on what exactly is happening regarding the response from Israel to, of course, that Iranian attack over the weekend. European stocks off by 1.6 percent. There's been a move, of course, into havens, as we said. Some of that, though, in the last 30 minutes to one hour has paired a bit on the back of the pushback from these Iranian state media, suggesting that they are less concerned about what is going on, or at least playing down the impacts, at least for now. But still, you get risk off. It's still there. It's just paired a little bit. Futures then pointing lower by 1.6% for European stocks. S&P E-minis as well. US futures pointing lower by nine tenths of a percent. But again, it was a much bleaker picture about an hour ago. Nasdaq futures pointing lower by about 175 points. The UK as well. The FTSE 100 looking at a print of 7,818, down 82 points. Let's flip the board then and look at some of those safe havens. There was a move, of course, into US Treasuries. At one point, the 10-year yield dropped 14 basis points. A big move into gold and oil above $90 a barrel. That, again, those safe haven moves have, to some extent, paired as well. Have we peaked in terms of the safe haven moves and adjustments so far in the session today? That remains a question mark. The Bloomberg dollar index was bid and remains bid, up two tenths of a percent. So the ripple, ripple across across the FX markets of Asia, again, pronounced. Gold at 2,384 per troy ounce, up two tenths of a percent after the continued strong run, of course, since February for the yellow metal. Brent at $88 a barrel, 92 now. So back below that $90 barrel, you did see a spike of 3%. You're now up 2%. And again, the 10-year and the Treasury curve remaining bid, 455, an eight basis point move lower in yields on the U.S. benchmark. Let's cross over to Asia now and get a sense of how the markets there reacting to the geopolitics. Avril Hong standing by for us in Singapore. Avril. Yeah, Tom, we saw that reaction loud and clear when those initial unconfirmed reports on the explosions in Iraq, Iraq, Syria came through. And it was really a sense of risk aversion and safe haven demand. We saw the gauge of stocks in the region slumping as much as 2.5%. The Nikkei losses accelerated to as much as 3.5%. Infotech sector, the biggest loser and still at the moment, as it got that triple whammy, not just from geopolitical tensions, but also... Also hawkish Fed speak as well as TSMC lowering its outlook for the chip sector. They are pairing the declines from earlier in the session, but it has to be said, you get the sense that traders were really not prepared for the sudden revival in Middle East tensions. I also want to highlight that amid all this, we've seen Chinese stocks' relative outperformance, or at least the bleed in them, wasn't as bad. A sign perhaps of how far Chinese equities have decoupled from global financial markets. Flip the board. The other thing I wanted to highlight is what we're seeing on the Japanese yen. We did see some safe haven demand, but compared to what we're seeing on the Swiss Sea, on treasuries, on gold, that safe haven play, the moves in the yen versus the greenback really quite tepid. So raising the question about its role as a traditional safe haven. Flip the board again as we look at how the EMFX have been taking a beating today. It's really that renewed pressure, no thanks to the initial surge in oil prices. You wonder what these economies, uh, the read-through potentially from inflation might be given the higher oil prices. We saw the rupee briefly hitting a fresh record low. The Philippine peso and the Korean won also really hard hit today. Tom. 
Ava Hong in Singapore with a market check. Thank you very much indeed. Let's get the details then in terms of how this story is unfolding. U.S. officials saying that Israel has struck targets in western Iran. This after multiple reports from Iranian news agencies of explosions around the city of Isfahan. Iranian state TV say all military and nuclear sites are safe in the city. Let's get more then from Bloomberg's Middle East anchor based in Dubai, Jamana Basechi. Jamana, what do we know then at this point about this strike? Good morning, Tom. Well, it is a fast-moving story indeed. Uh, well, we woke up hearing of explosions around Isfahan, which is, of course, Iran's third largest city this morning. A short while afterwards, two U.S. officials confirmed that Israel was indeed behind this attack. Shortly afterwards as well, we heard from the Israeli army radio saying that they had targeted an airbase in Isfahan, which happened to be the same airbase that launched the, uh, the, uh, the missiles and the drones uh, every, last weekend, of course, for their own retaliatory response to the Israel attacks on the diplomatic consulate in uh, Syria just a few weeks before. So there is a tit for tat taking place at this point in time. But I think what is crucial here is that Iranian state media have sought to downplay what has happened overnight. Mm. We have heard from Tasnim, which is a state aff affiliated uh, a station saying that there are no reports of an attack from abroad on Iran's central city of Isfahan or any part of the country uh, and that Iran's own air defense system had indeed been activated. Uh, and they were very quick to say that no uh, nuclear sites or key military sites had been harmed. And for markets, that sought to be a bit of a turnaround because uh, the nuclear site was what people were worried about being targeted. Um, but of course, this comes, uh, as we spoke about, um, on the heels of Iran's own direct attack on Israel last weekend. For days, there has been rampant speculation about how Israel would respond. Its allies, including the U.S. and, of course, other Arab countries have tried to downplay the situation and have cautioned uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu from an extreme response. And what we're seeing today is it appears to be a limited and proportionate response specifically targeting this mm. one airbase in Isfahan. Uh, and this is why I think you're seeing the reversal in markets, because it is seen to be limited and proportionate at this point in time. But of course, details are still fuzzy and it remains to be seen. Yeah, absolutely. Jamal, look, as you say, the really fascinating response coming through fr from, from Iran and how we decode that is going to be really crucial, isn't it, in the minutes and hours ahead. Um, in terms of your assessment, then, of the, of the escalation risk, you talked about the diplomacy, of course, that's been working its way through the region in the last few days. What, what is the assessment going to be right now of the, of the escalatory risk, um, given this, this strike that, again, U.S. officials say has happened? Mm. Well, I think it's important here to talk about uh, the Iranian response and what would actually prompt a bigger retaliation out of Iran at this point in time. Worth mentioning as well, yesterday, the Iranian foreign minister was speaking at the Security Council at the UN, uh, and he actually said yesterday that so far their response, their retaliation one week ago was sufficient, that they had done what they needed to do. And he warned Israel of further, quote unquote, adventurism in their own response. Whether or not the attack that we saw a couple of hours meets the, th the threshold of them responding further, again, we don't know at this point. But what we do know is internally, the state media, the press are downplaying what has happened. Uh, they are uh, assessing, of course, what has happened. But even uh, state media are denying reports that a security meeting at the top level Level is taking place. Uh, but the context is important here. Remember, this the attack last week was the first direct confrontation between Iran and Israel. This is Israel's response. It is actually the second time that they launch their own direct attack on Iran. Typically, it goes through, through proxies, uh, the likes of Hezbollah in Lebanon, and of course, uh, Hamas in Gaza, closely affiliated to Iran as well. So there is concern that perhaps other parts, other Iranian proxies could also get dragged into this as well. 
OK, Bloomberg's Middle East anchor based in Dubai, Jamana Pasechi, with the latest, of course, on this unfolding story. Jamana will be joining us again in the second half of the show with more details on how this story is unfolding. Oil markets, of course, in focus for us today on the back of these geopolitics. Jumping, of course, oil, Brent and WTI in the last few hours following those strikes in Iran. Brent pairing gains after rallying as much as 4.2 percent on these concerns about a wider regional conflict that could, of course, could endanger crude supplies. Let's bring in at this point, our senior energy reporter, Stephen Stratinsky, who's got his finger on the pulse of the oil markets for us this morning. Um, Stephen, what is the reaction so far? What do you make of the way the oil markets have reacted to this news? I think uh, shock and then a relative anxious calm. Uh, you know, when there were the first uh, unverified reports coming through on Twitter and, and other places, you did see a really sharp reaction in, in oil prices because there were folks who just weren't exactly sure what was happening. There were uh, unverified reports of explosions. And as more details started to kind of be teased out, uh, you know, Bloomberg reporters were able to confirm uh, that U.S. officials were aware that Israel had launched a strike. Um, and through that, you know, oil prices started to calm a little bit. Um, but now we are still 2% above uh, where we started the day. There is still some fear. And Clearly, as what's been explained just moments ago, uh, it does look like Iran uh, is trying to downplay this. Um, and it doesn't look like that there's any sort of um, retaliation from the Iranian side on, on all of this. But there is a bit of a fog of information coming through. So it's challenging to exactly see how this will happen. But at the moment, uh, when you talk to traders, when you look at the market, it doesn't look like uh, people are expecting this to spiral into a wider conflict that could affect uh, crude supply. But still, that anxiety is keeping prices about 2 percent up, which is still a, a, a pretty chunky uh, increase for today. Yep, 88.91 on Brent, as you say, up up 2%. Stephen, thank you very much indeed for the oil market reaction, of course, um, to this story and the conflict that continues. Stephen Stratinsky with the details on that. Stephen, thank you. To the macro now and New York Fed President John Williams saying that there is no rush to lower interest rates. These are the stories of the day. It's the geopolitics, but also, of course, the markets continuing to digest these hawkish comments from Fed officials. Williams was speaking at a summit then in Washington. He said economic data will determine determine the timing. It's not my baseline. My expectation right now is that you know, interest rates are in a good place and eventually at some point would want to lower interest rates as the economy really gets to the 2% inflation that we're headed towards. If the data are telling us that we would need higher interest rates to achieve our goals, uh, then we would, we would obviously want to do that. So it's not my base case. OK, let's bring in Jill Desis then, Bloomberg's news desk editor in Hong Kong. Jill, he let the cat out of the bag then, Williams. He mentioned the prospect. He said it's not his default case, but he did put on the table the prospect, potentially in certain scenarios, of a hike, another hike from the Fed. Yes. Oh, gosh, Tom, what a turnaround we've really had cool. even just over the past couple of weeks. I mean, you look back at, um, you know, the beginning of this week and, and ultimately, you know, some of Powell's comments and how much we've really pushed off this idea of uh, interest rate cuts coming, you know, in this year. I mean, I remember, Tom, just a few weeks ago, we were talking on this program about uh, the fact that there were still trader expectations for something as soon as June. Before that, as soon as March. Now we're talking about potentially, uh, you know, one or two cuts in 2020. Some saying maybe none in 2024. And now you've got Williams even floating the possibility of a potential hike if inflation really doesn't come down. I think, look, Tom, I, this really, really underscores how stubborn that last mile of really bringing that inflation down, trying to reach that 2% annual target that the Fed's really set here, how difficult all of that really is to accomplish. And I think the other thing that traders are really keeping in mind now, you know, this is absence, obviously, all of these, uh, you know, new geopolitical risks that have really bubble, bubbled up out of the Middle East today is, um, you know, this this now the central bank divergence that we may be experiencing between the Fed and the ECB. I mean, the ECB really telegraphing that idea of something, you know, a cut coming as soon as June. When you're taking that in consideration with now what you're hearing from Williams and others at the Fed uh, that are really pushing back those expectations of rate cuts, um, it really, I think, just shows what a market turnaround we've really seen and how difficult it's been to sort of calculate in, uh, the, the idea of what the Fed's trajectory is going to be through the rest of 2024. 
Yeah, pivoting on the pivot. Jill Desis out of Hong Kong, thank you very much indeed with the analysis around what we've been hearing from these increasingly hawkish Fed officials. Jill, thank you very much indeed. Here's what else is on your agenda today then. 7 a.m. UK time, we're going to get a retail sales print out of the UK, so a gauge there on the, on the health of the UK consumer, of course. We've been hearing about the Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey suggesting that inflation remains less of a challenge here. We'll talk about the consumer then retail at 7 a.m. UK time. On the earnings front, Procter & Gamble and American Express. American Express as well, of course, a touch on the US consumer that remains relatively strong, at least according to recent data. And today, we're also going to get continuation of the IMF and World Bank meetings as well in the US, of course. We'll be listening out for more sound from senior officials as they address the economic inflationary and central banking challenges of the moment. Coming up, almost one billion people in India begin voting today in the world's largest ever general election. It will last over six weeks. We are live in the city of Chennai. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Let's turn the focus now to India, where voters in the world's largest democracy are heading to the polls in an election set to last six weeks. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is hoping to emerge from the mammoth vote with a third, a third five-year term. Bloomberg's Haslinda Armin is and has been looking at this for us. But before we go there, let's bring in our correspondent on the ground, Menaka Doshi, who was outside a polling station in the southern city of Chennai, the capital of Tamil Nadu state. Uh, Menaka, what, what is the mood? Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Or good afternoon for you. Uh, what is the mood on the ground ahead of this, ahead of this, or the start of this mammoth vote for India? Well, the mood is hot. That's the best way I can describe it. And you will see fewer voters behind me uh, than we did witness early this morning. As the sun climbs through the day, the water turnout will fall. This is also a weekday. Uh, and then we might see a last minute rush before the polling booth shuts down. But Tom, as you mentioned, this is an important election, both domestically and for the global economy. India is the world's fastest growing economy. It is the world's fifth largest economy. And this is the largest democratic electoral process in the world. Now, as you pointed out, Prime Minister Modi is looking for a third term, but that's not all. He's looking for a third term with a super majority of 400 or more seats of the total 543. Now, here in Chennai, that ambition of his is going to be up for test because several parts of South India have not yet been charmed by Prime Minister Modi in the last election. He didn't, his party didn't win a single seat here. If he wants to be able to take the number of seats higher, he needs to win voters in the southern states of India. So that's the big battle that we will witness not just here in Tamil Nadu, but in many other southern states. And then, of course, this is a seven-phase election. So we've got six more weeks of reporting to do in peak summer. Amenika, you're going to be very busy indeed by the, by the sounds of it. OK, so he needs, to, he needs to win the votes of those southern states. And hard. Um, what, what is the... What, and, and hot, indeed, indeed. Stay, stay cool, certainly, Manika. Um, how is he hoping to, to, win, to win over those voters then? What is the policy prescription that he's leaning into? The consequences domestically for India, huge, of course, but globally as well, this is a hugely significant vote. Well, Prime Minister Modi's 10 years in power have been characterised by a few things. Um, GDP growth, yes, but lower than in previous decades. But that could be contextualized to a slowing global economy. But it has also been a time when he has chosen to assert a fairly strong leadership style. He's chosen to emphasize majoritarianism and religion. Um, and on the other hand, 
uh, has announced and delivered a slew of welfare schemes, more recently put large amounts of money into an infrastructure push in India, and his constant refrain is that he wants to see India as a developed country by 2047. That's within 100 years of India's independence. So it's an interesting mix of politics that's taken place over the last 10 years. Though India is growing at above 7% in terms of GDP, there are weaknesses in the economy, such as very low consumption numbers, um, joblessness, which is a critical and chronic problem. And all of these need to be fixed in subsequent terms of Mr. Modi or whoever the next government will be. OK, Manika Doshi on the ground for us in a steamy Chennai at the start of this marathon vote, of course, for India. Manika, thank you very much indeed. Coming up, a deficit of high quality iron ore, switching focus, is adding to the challenges of greening the steel making industry. Our weekly deep dive on the green transition is next. And we keep across, of course, all the geopolitics for you and the market reaction. This is Bloomberg. OK, time now for our weekly deep dive into the green energy transition. A shortage of high quality iron ore is proving a hurdle for the steel industry as it attempts to curb its emissions. Global demand for this type of iron ore is expected to outpace supply and could reach a deficit of 133 million metric tonnes by 2040. Those numbers from Yu Chen Hua on BNF's metals and mining team who joins me now with all the expertise. Uh, Yu Chen, how much more steel than demand will come from this energy transition? Well, the energy transition will be a relatively small demand for uh, demand for steel as the transitional uh, sectors including uh, wind turbines and uh, solar panels and electric grids will use steel as the fundamental material. But this is relatively small compared to the traditional sectors including construction and automaking. And that is to say, if the world is to get on track for net zero emissions by 2050, we estimate that this demand for steel from energy transition sectors will more than triple between today and the end of the de current decade. And, and steel making, of course, producing a lot of emissions. How then is the industry looking, looking to clean up its act? You're right, steel production is not very clean today. It is responsible about 8% of the global CO2 emissions, uh, about 5% in the EU. And that is because steel production today is still largely relying on burning coal to reduce iron ore into iron. And many steel making companies are betting on hydrogen as a replacement for coal for low carbon solution. And one big catch is, of course, the supply and cost of hydrogen in the future. But another catch is that the hydrogen-based direct reduction of iron ore requires very high-quality iron ore. Today, we are already seeing a shortage in the cyber market for this grade of material. And that deficit is only set to grow in the decade as more demand, especially from green steel projects, wraps up. And, and just very briefly, who's driving, who's driving the momentum then in terms of that demand? Currently, the Middle East is the largest source of demand for what we call the high-grade direct reduction grade iron ore. But of course, Europe is set to grow fast as the region looks to decarbonize. And particularly mm. as free allocation of emissions in the European Union is set to be phased out. And Europe okay. is on track to become the second largest demand center for, for direct mm. reduction grade iron ore. Uh, that's overtaking Asia by the end of the decade. Okay. Yu Chen Hua, thank you very much indeed from Bloomberg NEF's metals and mining team. If you'd like to hear more from BNF's analysts, download the Switched On podcast on Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, and of course log on to the terminal. Coming up, as US officials confirm Israel has struck targets in Iran, we bring you the latest analysis and market reaction. This is Bloomberg.
Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. These are the stories that set your agenda. Israel launches a strike on Iran, according to US officials. But there are conflicting reports out of Iran about the extent of any damage. Iranian media reports the country's nuclear facilities are safe. Stock slump as investors rush to haven assets on concerns of a widening Middle East conflict. Brent crude briefly spikes above $90 a barrel. Plus, voters in the world's largest democracy head to the polls. We are live in India as the country's six-week-long election gets underway. Let's check in on these markets. Markets, I should say. Uh, peak, of course, risk haven moves maybe uh, have started uh, to play out. We are still very much in risk off territory. Uh, but the upside that you saw in some of those havens pairing a little bit, at least so far in this session. You're looking, of course, at futures still firmly in the red when it comes to the stock market picture. European futures pointing lower by 1.4 percent. FTSE 100 futures pointing lower by close to a full percentage point. And S&P E-minis looking at just above that 5,000 level. Five straight days of losses across U.S. stocks. Pointing lower by eight tenths of a percent today. The hawkish commentary coming through from the Fed, but front and centre for us right now, of course, is the geopolitics and this strike, apparently, by Israel on Iran. Nasdaq futures pointing lower by 100 171 points. Let's flip the board then and look at how the money has moved into some of those havens. You've seen yields move lower across the Treasury curve, undoing some of the selling pressure that we saw at the front end of this week when it comes to the US Treasury market. The benchmark at 455 yields down close to seven basis points right now. The Bloomberg dollar index, the dollar is bid once again up two tenths of a percent. Gold also getting a further lift up a little over a tenth of a percent at 2,382. 2,400 is seen as a resistance level for the yellow metal. We'll see if we break through that. $88.98 on Brent, having broken through that $90 level earlier in the day on the back of those initial reports, now up 2%, having seen a pop of over 3% earlier. But still, $89 a barrel on Brent, prices again up. And year to date, of course, we have seen continued price pressures coming through on Brent and WTI. Let's get the latest then in terms of this story on the geopolitics. U.S. officials saying that Israel has struck targets in western Iran. That's after multiple reports from Iranian news agencies of explosions around the city of Isfahan. Iranian state media saying all military and nuclear sites are safe in the city. Let's get the details then with Bloomberg's Middle East anchor based in Dubai, Jamana Basechi. Jamana, what do we know then at this point about the strike? Yeah, good morning, Tom. Well, ever since Iran's unprecedented attack on Israel last weekend, there's been rampant speculation as to how Israel were looking to respond. And indeed, it seems like the response has come overnight. Now, explosions were heard around uh, Iran's third largest city, Isfahan, very early in the morning. Shortly afterwards, U.S. officials confirmed that, indeed, Israel had launched an attack on Isfahan. Details are still fuzzy at this point, but what we do understand is that the target of this specific attack was the airbase, the airbase in Isfahan, which actually was the same airbase that Iran used to launch those drones and those missiles that they used last weekend for their attack on Israel. Now, uh, at this point, what we are hearing from Iranian state officials is that they are downplaying the extent of this attack. They were very quick to say that none of their nuclear facilities had been targeted. There was no harm there. And that, of course, caused a bit of a turnaround in market because initially there was some concern that Israel were going to go after those nuclear facilities. Uh, and they're recently just saying moments ago, Iranian local media Tasnim has also said that there are no reports of an attack from uh, abroad on, it, on Iran's central city of Isfahan or any any part of the country and that Iran's own air defense system uh, was the uh, was the source of all of that noises. So again, details are very fuzzy mm. at this point. But analysts are quick to point out that if this is indeed the Israel response to those unprecedented Iranian attacks on Israel last weekend, then they are deemed to be quite limited and proportionate in nature. But of course, it is up to the Iranians at this point on how they will choose to respond. Yeah, and give us a little bit more detail then, Jamana, in terms of in terms of that potential uh, Iranian re response and, and and the implications. 
Yes, yeah, so the Iranian state media have actually denied that a Security Council meeting is taking place at this point. So we haven't had anything from Iranian leadership. All that we can parse together is what we're hearing from Iranian state media. And as I just said earlier, uh, they have been denying reports of extensive damage within the country. But what we do know is that Israel themselves are preparing themselves for a possible retaliation. Uh, we know that the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem uh, staff there have been warned about the possibility of a retaliation as well. But again, as you were just referring to, because this at this point appears to be a very limited strike on one specific military base, perhaps it could be uh, deemed insufficient enough to worry a significant response from Iran. The background, of course, yesterday, the Iranian foreign minister was speaking at the Security Council and he warned Israel against further adventurism. Whether or not this qualifies as adventurism, again, remains to be seen. Mm. It is a fast-moving story. Yeah, absolutely. And as you say, that test will be crucial, won't it, in terms of the Iranian response. Jamana Pasechi, thank you very much indeed with all of the latest, of course, on this unfolding story. Joining us out of Dubai, our Middle East anchor. Let's get a more of a deep dive in terms of the market reaction then. Treasuries jumping, of course, along with the dollar as concerns over an escalation, potential escalation. What has escalated is there further escalation in the cards, of course, in the Middle East. Bolsters that demand for haven assets. Some of that demand has eased off in the last couple of hours. Let's bring in Ven Ram from Bloomberg's MLive team for the reaction to this. Ven, what is your take on the market response to what we're seeing in terms of Israel and Iran? Morning, Tom. So far, the market's reaction has been pretty uh, measured, and uh, that reflects, mm. you know, as you said, you know, just one military, one strike so far on a military base. Does, we don't know the, whether this is going to be the only retaliation from Israel, and w how Iran is going to react. So the reaction in the coming days will depend on how how. How, whether this is going to escalate and how protracted this new epicenter of conflict is going to be. Uh, but at the moment, the markets are kind of, be, you know, there's been a measured reaction. There was an initial bit of flight towards havens, but that, but as you said, you know, that has come off a bit. But, you know, going forward, it will be the, the degree of response and how protracted it proves to be that will determine whether or not the havens are bid, continue to be bid. What are the preferred havens right now? We talk about the yen, we talk about the Swissy gold. Uh, some of the gains in, in terms of what we're seeing in gold have kind of eased off in the last hour or so. Then, uh, where are the money flows when it comes to those preferred havens? I think the three biggest preferred havens for this conflict are going to be the treasuries, uh, German bonds, and gold. And if you look at, you know, treasuries and bonds are kind of self-explanatory because, you know, that's where the money is going to go because, you know, people want the safest assets and you can't get safer assets than those. In terms of gold, you know, what we, in the past two months, it surged a lot already on signs that, you know, this conflict could escalate. And if you look at gold's move, it's kind of contraindicated to everything else. Because if you look at inflation adjusted real rates in the U.S., they've actually gone up over the past two months. That would typically bring the value of gold down. And again, you know, investors were pricing some 80 basis points of rate cuts from the Fed at the end of February by for 2024. Now they reckon we'll get less than two rate cuts by the end of the year. So again, that's a factor that should have hobbled gold. Instead, gold has surged, so suggesting that investors do see gold as a haven in, if this particular conflict it proves to be protracted. OK, Ven Ram, thank you very much indeed around the favoured havens uh, given this conflict from, of course, our MLive team. Bringing the analysis and the market reaction. Ven, thank you. Now to what is happening in Europe. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz says he is sending a third patriot system to Ukraine and more will follow from other EU member states. He was speaking to reporters after an informal meeting of EU leaders in Brussels with G7 foreign ministers meeting today. Berlin is pushing for stronger support for Kyiv. Let's get more then from Bloomberg's Oliver Crook in Berlin who was covering this meeting out of Brussels for us yesterday. Oli, what is a Ukraine's defence situation right now? Will the support from Olaf Scholz and Germany be enough? 
It will certainly make a difference. It will certainly not be enough, right? We know that there's the ammunition shortage, which is something we've been talking about for months now, where you know Russia is firing maybe five times more artillery shells than Ukraine is. That's been going on for a long time. What we've seen now is Russia really focusing on a lot of the infrastructure within Ukraine and some of the power uh, generating supplies. And so what they need is air defense systems, right? And Olaf Scholz says he's sending another Patriot uh, battery defense system. He said that according to the conversations he had with EU leaders in Brussels, that they can expect uh, another six on the way. But there is a pretty great frustration, which I think is perhaps best embodied by the sort of candid tweet that was put out by um, uh, Donald Tusk saying that if all the words that were said in the last years here in Brussels about common defense could be changed into bullets and rocket launchers, Europe would have some of the strongest, we would have become one of the strongest powers in the world and the safest place. And that sort of echoes some of the things that we've heard from some of the defense CEOs that I spoke to also in Brussels saying, listen, if you want this capacity up and you want to deliver on a new paradigm for European defense, we need to get the order flow in and we need to make these decisions now. And the question is, of course, always around financing and that sort of thing. But there is a certain sort of disconnect between the rhetoric and the action within Brussels. We say that the G7 foreign ministers meeting, you know, Annalena Baerbock, the German foreign minister, is really pushing for more support to Kyiv. But really the thing that we need to watch is probably the major breakthrough, which is Mike Johnson bringing this to the floor of the House to get that Ukraine aid bill in through the United States. That's been stalled for six months, Tom. $61 billion for Ukraine. So that could have movement as soon as tomorrow. Yeah, does Johnson get that across the line or does he get ousted by those extreme right Republicans in his, in his own party? A, a crucial question, isn't it? And, and of consequence for Ukraine. Ollie, look, you, you outlined this for us brilliantly yesterday, Mario Draghi, uh, with the report and the priorities that Europe should focus on in terms of competition with the US, competition with China, Chinese influence as well. Do they, do they come up with any answers? Well, in short, Tom, the answer to that is no. Uh, you know, you had this sort of stark warnings from Enrico Letta. He put out a 150-page report um, he gave to leaders. Admittedly, that report came kind of late, so the leaders and their teams maybe didn't have enough time to read it in great detail before the meeting to get those conclusions out. Draghi made that speech, um, a a as you mentioned. And what's interesting is we saw a draft proposal of the sort of the conclusions from the meeting that included a line that said, Europe needs an urgent paradigm shift. They took that line out of the final, uh, the final conclusion. So that gives you an idea of where they got. So where the sticking points were, were around the capital markets union. Really what Leda and Draghi have been pushing for is a bigger single market, more capital flows, and that means more centralized supervision. There could not be agreement around that. France, Italy, Spain, uh, the Netherlands are sort of in favor of this. There was a lot of pushback from the smaller nations. You have the question of you know, harmonizing tax uh, rates across Europe. Of course, a very thorny question for, say, Estonia and Ireland. And this really goes to show Show, Tom, the difficulty of political consensus despite the looming sort of, you know, I mean, they're talking about in terms of basically economic obsolescence for Europe if it doesn't get its act together. But there is so much complicated pol politics in here that making forward progress on this, as we've seen, is very challenging. OK, Bloomberg's Oliver Crook, thank you very much indeed with the latest. Now, we bring you some more lines when it comes to what U.S. officials say is this Israeli strike on Iran. The IAEA, of course, the International Atomic Energy Agency, confirming no damage, no damage to Iran's nuclear facilities and nuclear sites. So backing up what we've been hearing from Iranian state media who had said that the nuclear sites at Isfahan had not been impacted, not been damaged. Now the IAEA coming out and saying they confirm there has been no damage to Iran's nuclear sites. And we know that a strike on those sites would have been one of the worst case scenarios in terms of the potential risk within this region. We know it's a scenario that potentially Israel's looking at. It seems like that is not a scenario that's played out and the IAE confirming no damage to those nuclear sites. We, of course, keep across this story for you. There's plenty more coming up in terms of the earnings front as well. And we'll break that story down for you with a focus on Netflix coming up. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Let's switch focus, at least for now, away from the geopolitics, Iran and Israel. We'll keep across that story for you, but focus now, briefly at least, on the earnings story as well. Because Netflix shares fell in extended trading, despite reporting its best start to the year since 2020. The streaming giant added over 9 million new customers in the first quarter, nearly double analyst estimates. For the details then, let's bring in Bloomberg's Chloe Melly with the top lines on this. Chloe, how did Netflix do then? 
Well, there were some very rosy forecasts from analysts um, ahead of the first quarter. And by and large, Netflix delivered. So as you said, it really beat expectations in terms of subscribers. That led it to be on earnings and sales as well. Um, and it also upgraded its operating margin forecast for the year. Uh, but there are a couple of things that might worry investors a little bit. Um, the first being that it will stop um, reporting subscriber metrics starting from uh, the first quarter of 2025, which means that there might be, it implies a slowdown there. And also um, the uh, revenue guidance for the second quarter is a little bit weaker than anticipated. So that's probably why there were um, a little bit of... Uh, of weakness in in um, in trading. Yeah, and they've benefited, haven't they, from the, from the clampdown on, on password sharing? We yes. want, and, we, and there's a question mark over to what extent that continues to benefit benefit them. What are the key key kind of growth drivers then for Netflix going forward? Well, as you mentioned, yeah, the, currently the, the, the password crackdown is still kind of boosting them. Mm. Um, they've also introduced a, a subscription tier with ads, um, and that is developing quite well. About 40% of new customers are choosing this option in markets where that is available. And there's also a very strong slate of programming. So in this first quarter, there was Love is Blind, The Gentleman, really, really big successes for Netflix there. Chloe, thank you very much indeed thank on you. those Netflix earnings and the top lines coming through, of course, from that streaming company. We switch focus now to the cosmetics space and the luxury space. L'Oreal bouncing back after reporting better than first quarter sales. The French cosmetics giant, of course, saying that strength in Europe and North America helped offset sluggish demand in the other crucial market of China. Let's bring in Deborah Aitken, our senior analyst from Bloomberg Intelligence, for a deep dive on this story then. The key drivers behind the, behind the sales coming through from L'Oreal then, Deborah. Yeah, so... Um 9%, and the big thing here, it was a couple of um, percent ahead of the market, a couple of hundred basis points ahead of market expectation. Mm. But it was on a big year ago, 13% growth. And the stock had kind of underperformed into the, uh, the, the sales number only. Uh, on the back of data coming through from other peers like Ulta, in the US where product was seen as a little bit old in the stores and others and also from Sakana industry data so there was a bit of an expectation I feel in the market that they may have just met so that was very good and then it's about that double digit growth so plus 10 percent growth um, in North American market in European market doing very well in mass market uh, where we would expect maybe some price pinching still pricing going through there the big area for them to dermatology, and that's still up over 20%. You know, so overall, there were three out of the four sectors and three out of four regions that did well. Three out of four regions. One yes. of the regions that didn't do so well, China. Yes. Talk to us about that. Yes. So uh, China for them is up 6% actually, mm. against a market which is generally flat. And that's another 100 basis points higher than they were at the Q4. So they're gradually improving their market share versus the China overall. And China is gradually improving itself, but it's slow pace. And outside of that, too, you have on the look side. So that's only up just less than 2%. North Asia was down 1% because of China. Uh, market overall flat and also because of the travel retail industry. So we've heard from L'Oreal, from Estee Lauder, from Beisdorf, which owns La Prairie brand. They're absolutely waiting for travel retail to clear out all that inventory to go. Now L'Oreal says it's a little bit better than it was. They can see it moving. Sellout is stronger. Um, and that they're still pitching for two half will be when things pick up. And just on travel retail generally outside of China, uh, you know, if for Asia overall, we're still rating for about 25% repair versus 2019, whereas most other regions, we expect to hit 100% of where they were by the end of this year, and Middle East and others are already above that. Um, but we, we are actually seeing more and more, and we've covered this a little bit, but money going from China over into Japan, traveling to Thailand, to Singapore and others. So the actual China number um, is kind of um, a mystified number versus where money is really being spent. It's about the Chinese cohort. Very interesting. Deborah, thank you very much indeed. With analysis from Bloomberg Intelligence, of course, in terms of these L'Oreal numbers and the read across, across the regions and the different segments of that business. There's plenty more coming up. We'll keep across, of course, the Iran-Israel story for you. The market reaction to that crucial geopolitical story. And also the reaction to the increasingly hawkish commentary from Fed officials. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg.
every time we come up to one of these having events, it really does come back to the fundamentals of supply and demand. The crypto industry goes through cycle. This is to be expected. There's going to be market volatility. It doesn't only impact the asset front. I mean, given the geopolitical tension, given the interest rate environment that we are seeing, the inflationary environment. Obviously, Bitcoin um, and, and crypto right now in general is a part to the uh, global financial system. So we are not completely disconnected from what's happening in, uh, in, in equities, for example, and what's happening with monetary policy or with what's happening in the geopolitical environment. We've been preparing for many years. You know, our, our business is one that requires long-term planning and these halvings are known events. And so the evolution of mining has really changed since previous halvings where we had a really fragmented market. I think a lot of investors are eagerly anticipating to see what the market reaction will be. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Let's bring you the detail in terms of what continues to unfold. U.S. officials telling Bloomberg that Israel has struck sites in Iran. Iranian media playing down the impact. The IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, coming out in the last 30 minutes saying that the nuclear sites in Iran are not impacted. Here's the map then. Isfahan, of course, is the location of one of their key nuclear facilities. And again, the IAEA and Iranian state media saying there has been no damage to this site. We know that had been a worst case scenario in terms of the potential repercussions and retaliatory risks and the spiraling conflict potential in the Middle East if Israel had damaged that site. Again, so far, state media in Iran and the IAEA saying there has been no damage to Isfahan. We continue to work out the details of what has unfolded in Iran. The fog of war is very much at play here, but it seems like Iranian officials and Iranian state media are downplaying what U.S. officials tell us is this attack by Israel on Iran. Let's see the market reaction to that then. It seems like the risk-off moves have peaked, at least for now. Here's the oil impact then. The upside for oil that we've seen on the back of this event actually we're about half of what we saw. We had seen Brent prices spike about 4%, over 4%, crossing above that $90 a barrel level. You're seeing gains of a little under 2% right now. So, again, pairing some of that risk-off move, $88 a barrel, 77 currently on Brent. This, of course, is the intraday move. That is the spike on the back of these news lines crossing. And then you've paired some of the price gains that we've seen in Brent. Let's flip the board and look at some of the other assets and some of the other haven moves. Of course, gold being bid as well. But again, gold giving up a lot of those gains right now. You can see the spike there and we're almost back to the pre-event levels in gold. Just up a tenth of a percent on spot intraday 2,382. 2,400, by the way, seen as a key technical level for the yellow metal. And Bitcoin. If anyone thought that Bitcoin was a move in terms of a haven, well, that's been put to bed again with moves lower in Bitcoin, offsetting the optimism that some had around, of course, the halving event. This is the yield of of course, in terms of Treasury yields, and there has been a move into Treasury with yields lower. There's going to be more analysis across this in great detail. Markets Today is next with all the analysis. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg.